Hi everybody, Dr. John here with Life Spa Ayurveda. Today I want to talk about the pros and the cons of the carnivore diet, a diet that is definitely gaining more and more popularity. You know, at first blush you might say, oh my God, all meat diet, how can that be good for you? Well, there's some interesting studies that I want to share with you that are important for you to know. I mean, the all meat, all animal product diet is not something new. For example, you know, the Inuits in the Arctic Circle have been eating a mostly animal protein, animal fat diet for thousands of years, and they have some interesting studies behind them um, showing that they live a long and healthy life. There was a study when some of the explorers came up to the Arctic Circle, and they actually did the Inuit diet, and they actually thrived on it for a year that they were studied. And I think the big question is, is the carnivore diet something that, number one, should we do? And is it something that should be done for an extended period of time? And that is kind of where the rubber meets the road. I think that the end of the day here, the carnivore diet is really a matter of dose and a matter of duration. So we're we'll dig into that, dig into some of the science. If you're watching this on my website at lifespot.com, please subscribe. Check out our newsletter that you get so you get this information every week in your inbox. And also check out our Ayurvedic store on the way out. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like, follow, and subscribe. Thanks so much, guys. All right, so let's dig into this. Um, also, in 1797, Dr. John Rollo in St. Lucia did a study on an all-animal protein diet, uh, no vegetables, uh, no carbohydrates, and, uh, and did this with diabetes. And the results on this diet were so powerful that that became, in the 1700s, the standard treatment for diabetes for many, many years, and it was very, very successful. Then insulin was discovered, and all of a sudden, it was a lot easier just to take an injection, and you can go back to eating whatever you wanted again, and that's, of course, the somewhat of the American way, right? But that diet definitely showed a lot of benefit. So in 2021, there was another study that had um, over 2,000 people in the study, and they actually measured their metabolic health. They saw significantly lower in their hemoglobin A1C, which is a three-month average of your blood sugar. They saw a significant re 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 reduction in fasting glucose. They saw lower um, blood sugar levels, lower cholesterol levels, lower LDL levels, and they saw significant weight reduction. Right? Everything that everybody wants, they got from the carnivore diet. So it's no surprise as to why folks are, are jumping on this carnivore diet, because it does move the needle significantly. Uh, to make this even more amazing, the folks that were diabetic in this study, over 267 of them were diabetic, and of the diabetics, 84% of them were able to get off their oral medication. And the ones that were type 2 diabetics, 92% of them were able to stop their insulin uh, injections, which was amazing, right? So, so as a diet, and call it a medicinal diet, there's no shortage of, of benefits and something that we should all be thinking of. You know, in Ayurvedic medicine, they always looked at red meat as a medicine. They looked at those foods as med medicines because the proteins in animal, uh, in animal protein, in, in animal foods, uh, like red meat, are extremely acidic. They're acid albumins, as opposed to vegetarian-based proteins like nuts are more on the alkaline side. And you know that, that um, alkaline foods are going to cleanse you and clean you and detoxify you. But if you're insufficient in the proteins that you've been getting, then the more acidic the protein, the more penetrating it's going to be and deliver that protein in a more beneficial way. And also, you're going to, by re reducing your carbohydrates or significantly avoiding them, you're going to kind of shift the microbiome to a stable of bugs called actinobacteria that are really good at delivering fat and fiber as the fuel supply as opposed to delivering sugar as the fuel supply, which predominate in our gut naturally in the fall, we're gonna see bugs like bacteria, bacteria deeds, uh, uh, um, which are really good at getting sugar out of the bloodstream, 
Obviously, this is when the fruits and the grains and, and all of the starches are naturally harvested in the fall. But in the springtime, the actinobacteria, which are good at delivering fat and fiber as fuel, are predominant in your gut, according to the Stanford studies that were done on the hunter-gatherer tribe. So the bugs in the soil change dramatically from season to season. We should change dramatically from season to season, which is why I wrote a book called The Three-Season Diet, which is why we put out a free you know, three-season diet eating guide where people can actually get recipes and grocery lists every month of the year. It's really important. So again, back to the, the hard-to-answer question, is the carnivore diet something that we should stay with long term? Well, let's dive into that. First of all, when they actually took this, did studies on the Inuits, they found that they had evolved to have a genetic adaptation to not let them build up ketones or be, eat a ketogenic diet for any length of time. So in other words, when the, when the Westerners went up there and ate the ketogenic diet, the high protein, high fat diet, that was blubber and fish and all that meat and animal protein all day long with no vegetables, they built up ketones in their body, which for a short term can create a lot of benefit, but in the long term can actually have some detriment. So, but the Inuits didn't build up those ketones. So for them, they were adapted to that carnivore-esque diet not having a lot of carbohydrates or vegetables, but the Western folks didn't have that genetic adaptation. So that's sort of really interesting. And then you also have to recognize that, you know, we're talking about eating an average carnivore breakfast would be eggs and bacon. Lunch would be like a hamburger patty with some cheese. A snack would be sardines and dinner would be steak. I mean, that's it. Now, there are now modifications of the carnivore diet coming, allowing you to eat some non or low carbohydrate vegetables like zucchini and spinach and greens or berries or uh, other things um, like um, some nuts and seeds and things like that. But the backdrop, the elephant in the room, are all the studies that we've heard for years that have told us that eating meat will increase your risk of certain cancers. I mean, there was a study done in 2021 with over 100,000, 100, 180,000 folks, and they found that, that the ones who ate the most meat had a 20% increased risk of cardiovascular disease, a 53% increased risk of heart disease, 101% increased risk of dying of a stroke for those who ate the most meat compared to those who ate the least amount of meat. And that was also meat and processed meat. So there is the kind of the, 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 the differentiating factor. And that is whether it's just those processed meats that are bad or what if you ate grass-fed meat. There are studies show that grass-fed meat is completely different than grain-fed meat and that grass-fed meat may not have that cancer risk uh, associated with it. Studies do show that pe people who ate more uh, red meat has significantly more risk of colon cancer and breast cancer. Those studies are there. And also just the fact that the lack of vegetables have actually been studied to actually increase the risk of certain types of cancers as well as heart disease. So we can't sort of forget those studies and just say, well, they're automatically not right. So my suggestion is that this carnivore diet is a diet that is a kind of no carb, get your body to burn the fat as fuel and stop this incessant, you know, overzealous ability that we have as kind of modern Western humans to deliver sugar out of the gut into the blood and overwhelm the, the bloodstream and the body with sugar creating prediabetes and type 2 diabetes way more you know, prevalent you know, obesity, cholesterol levels, all that comes as a result of that. So as a reset, it does make sense. Maybe for a month or so, you could do that diet uh, grass-fed and do all that and have it make sense. If you're gonna do something like that, do it in the springtime because that's when nature would naturally put you into natural, a natural state of ketogenesis. In the fall, it's, we're harvesting you know, um, seeds and grains and nuts and fruits, all high starch foods which the bugs in the gut are supposed to be bacteria to deliver that sugar as a fuel supply. 
store reserve fuel, add a little extra fat for insulation for the winter coming. In the springtime, it's an austere harvest. If you look out your window in the spring, there's no grains to be harvested. There's no pasta or pizza to be harvested. It's a low carbohydrate or no carbohydrate time of the year. Traditional fasts were done and most of religions do their fasting in the spring. So it's a calorie restricted, low carb time of the year, a time of the year where if you just get rid of the carbs, um, that would be the ideal thing that we should all be thinking about every single spring because that's what nature's plan was. Now, if you want to do that by eating just meat and no carbs, that would be an option. You could do it in a vegetarian way. You could do it in a vegan way. It doesn't really matter. But if you're living off the land, as all of our ancestors did, they didn't have carbohydrates in the spring. And I think that's the big thing that's happening with a carnivore diet is you're giving your body a full-on break from the carbohydrates, which we've overdone and created a stable of bugs in your gut that are really good at delivering sugar out of your blood, into your, out, of your, out of your gut, into your blood, and creating a predisposition to weight gain, metabolic syndrome, and of course, blood sugar related issues. So there you have it. I wrote a pretty comprehensive article with all the science on the good, the bad, and the ugly. There's definitely good. There's definitely some risks you have to be, be concerned about. And I think it's all about giving your body a low carb break in a seasonal way. And that is basically called seasonal eating, something all of us did, right? If you're a hunter gatherer and you have a harvest in the fall that's abundant, you can't eat the food out of your garden fast enough, are you gonna go hunting and kind of over hunt your environment so come winter there's nothing for you to hunt when you desperately need those foods if you're a hunter gatherer? No, you're gonna have a higher amount of fruits and vegetables and grains and, 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 and tubers and starch in the fall, and you're gonna have a significant higher amount of protein and fat in the winter and into the spring. That is how all of our ancestors did it. And if we can mimic that and get back into our natural rhythm of eating the right food in the right season when our gut bugs are supposed to be inoculated with a different stable of bugs to deliver different fuel from season to season. You can learn more about this at lifespot.com. I wrote a book called The Three Season Diet. We have a three season diet eating guide, which is free. You can get it at lifespot.com. And again, check out our newsletter where I put articles with all the scientific references proving ancient modern wisdom with modern, with ancient modern wisdom, uh, ancient wisdom, medical wisdom, Ayurvedic wisdom with modern science. All right, guys, thanks for listening. I'll see you next time. Do you like this video? Don't forget to subscribe and share. This recording is brought to you by LifeSpa, where ancient Ayurvedic wisdom meets modern science. Get access to free health video newsletters by Dr. John at LifeSpa.com. These statements have not been evaluated by the FDA. These products are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease.